Riser, but good evening to everyone. Yep. So, so wonderful to be part of the inaugural um, conference here in Australia. I hope everyone is doing well. So as Isabella said, my topic is the focus on what I call wellness foundation, fundamentals and mental health for the individuals living with sickle cell disease. Uh, so I was able to listen in on some of the topics that were being discussed and the newborn screening and services learning early. Uh, and we have a concept when we talk about the caring for sickle cell patients, especially from a provider perspective, because I am a warrior, I do have sickle cell disease, but I'm also a provider. And we we liked, we are, we have developed over the years a comprehensive sickle cell. We take care of our patients with sickle cell disease from infancy all the way up to um, adulthood, we are doing better and trying to do better and better and better as the patient ages, what we call kind of wraparound services. Um, but there is a fundamental that I want to share with you of what I feel really helps the patient who has this disease process just be well. So sickle cell disease, as many of you know, and many people who are listening, um, is an illness that requires a comprehensive care program of, over the lifespan, as I co communicated with you. And it involves many people in that lineage of care, patients, families, providers, community-based organizations, federal agencies, private agencies, political represent representatives and innovators. And we know that when everyone is sitting at the table with the patient focused, that we can deliver the best care. So as we, as we were discussing that sensitive buttons when you advance from uh, the slide to slide sometimes, um, a comprehensive care model is the best model. Multidisciplinary comprehensive care that is accessible, well-coordinated and evidence-based for patients living with sickle cell disease. What are some of those components that uh, make that kind of ideal and optimal care plan. Integrated behavioral health, psychosocial support, mental health, health systems management, support for academic and vocational goals, integrative health component, community-based component, advocates and champion. And I would say as far as the stakeholders, everyone within this care plan has an equal share in making it work. Of course, again, with the center being the advocates, they really should guide and steer this plan. And as entities are getting stronger, as universities and as hospitals are getting stronger, they are really getting all those components together. That's an ideal model. That is what we're aiming for. The realization is that it's not there everywhere. And when we look at mental health, there are some diagnoses that are obvious to certain people and some that are not as obvious. But I wanted to put this in the front of the presentation because the mental health component for individuals living with sickle cell disease is just as important as all the other elements that we've talked about, your lab work, seeing your, going to your visit and so on and so forth. But traditionally, it might not have gotten the attention that it needed to get. And now we're doing a better job in identifying it. One is warriors, because it's challenging to be able to talk about it, but then also as providers and then providing the proper services, people who are trained in this field in order to assist patients with these challenges. Some of the most common ones I've listed, depressive syndrome, isolation syndrome. We always talk about sickle cell disease as being a disease of isolation. Sometimes we feel like we are suffering alone. Feelings of helplessness, those are very different suicidality, anxiety. Oh my gosh, I have another crisis coming on. What am I going to do? You know, it builds because we can feel it coming. And then we're thinking, is it going to be a full-blown crisis? Is it going to be a level one crisis? There's so many levels of that anxiety. And we carry that with us all the time because there is a moment, an element of psychosis, but the PTSD, remembering how bad that last crisis is or one in our past and wondering, will that happen again? Will this be the crisis that? And there's been probably a lack of attention over the years in those levels that many of us carry actually simultaneously. But again, now there's more attention towards it. Some that are not as common is the pain crisis episodes. They have their own mental stressors, the chronicity of the illness, trauma, dealing with sickle cell disease as a traumatic event. This is kind of a new concept that people are coming to realization and 
treating the each incident as a traumatic event. The unpredictable nature of the illness makes it very challenging and what we call a disruptive syndrome. So for individuals like myself who have this disease process and many who may be listening, we have to almost reboot ourselves every single time we have a crisis. It's almost like we lose control of our life and the pace of our life. And then we have to enter back into life again. So it's, it makes our disease process very different from other disease processes. What does that fundamental wellness fundamental plan look like? I like to call it a model where the patient is in the center. And as we talked about, we have the comprehensive component, a coordinated component, accessible component, and also committed to quality and safety. We want to make sure that those tenants are always part of the process. But where do we start? So the model, the ideal model for an individual living with sickle cell disease is a biopsychosocial model. So that model does not ignore any of the parts that a patient has to confront or deal with within their sickle cell process. It weighs the components equally. And historically, there was an emphasis on definitely the medical part of it. So the preference is to think about the person as a whole person first. I am an individual, a human being that has a disease process. So let's start with the person. Consider the macro factors that may be impacting them and their disease process. So those macro factors are the environment, stress, cultural barriers, their emotional state, what are their sleep patterns? And then we should think about the micro. A lot of times in this setting of care, we start with the micro first. It's all about the lab work, radiology, when was your last crisis? What did it feel like on a scale of one to 10? Which really focuses everything on the crisis's hand. But did we think about the human being first that's walking into the clinic or walking into a care facility and then merging those two stories together? Because a lot of times when we go straight to the micro, we miss some essential facts. So it's a retraining almost of how we should approach the patient so that we really get the full picture. And in getting the full picture and addressing a biopsychosocial model, we get the most information in order to deliver and provide. I think what is also important is that is then we can instill the tools that might be lacking for the patient themselves to be proactive. So remember that the physical health, the mental health and well-being are not mutually exclusive. They should be addressed together. So the wellness fundamentals, what are the components? I like to say that they're very simply four components. Eat well, love more, move more, and stress less. That's the quick and easy way. And I think everybody can remember that. And I'll say it again, living well with sickle cell. What are the tenants, the basics of doing that? Eat well, love more, move more, and stress less. And I think when you think of this as the foundation, this is what the patient can stand on and get ownership of self. Then you apply all those wraparound services and that elevates the care, that makes it a total care plan. But this has to be taught. We're not born necessarily knowing all this, these tenants. Can we shift our perspective to a person-focused plan? Comprehensive plan plus patient-centered gives us a person focus. I'm a human being first. So let's look at, into that a little bit. So if I were to break it up into the tenants, they are meditation, connection, nutrition, exercise and movement, yoga, and self-awareness. Those are the eight tenants that make up that wellness fundamental. Oh, my PowerPoint slides are really acting up today. There we go. So why? Science has shown that when you have a program like this, you positively impact the course of the chronic disease process, which is what we have. You lengthen the telomeres, the health of the nerves. You decrease inflammation. It improves the immune system and it slows the aging process down. We all love to be able to have the science that backs it up. And there is a wealth of information and research that backs up and supports 
having a program of this nature. Self-awareness, let's start here. Knowing that this is a disease. Yes, we are born with the self of self, excuse me. And SCD, sickle cell disease is a disease of isolation. So that anything promoting isolation leads to more chronic stress and often the illness. So that ramps up our disease process. So how can we shift away and create self environments where the individual does not feel as isolated? And in that, one of the tenets is actually achieving intimacy. And there are two types of intimacy, horizontal intimacy and vertical intimacy. Intimacy with self, and that is something that we can work on. How well do I know myself? How honest can I be with myself and really tap into what my body is telling me is going on? And then how do I communicate that intimacy with others, people who are my agents, people who are my group, people who support me? So that having that communication improves my health status. Research has shown that social isolation is a strong predictor of mortality. So that if we can remove individuals with sickle cell disease from one, that mindset, but also that surrounding, we improve their quality of life. We are born with a sense of self and then we, we lose it. We ad identify ourselves with everything else externally. So how can we just reconnect and tap back into us? Because you can work on doing that. A lot of times we are defined by our disease process. And I have to say, whoa, 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 wait, I just happen to have sickle cell disease. But I am Marjorie Desjoie Brewer. I'm all these other beautiful things. How do I tap back into that sense of self, which then empowers me so that I can take care, better care of myself and then make the right connections? Because there is a connection between when we feel stressed and why. So that stress is a teacher. It does take some kind of rewiring of the brain because initially, like I, what, like I said at the beginning, we have flight or flight syndrome. We feel the stress. We get anxious. We clamp down. But then we can teach ourselves to come around and think, OK, what happened during that stress? What can that stress teach me? What was my trigger? And individuals and pro providers may ask, well, how do I get that conversation started? How do I have people tap back into their sense of self? I always remind them that pain is a catalyst. If someone were to tell me, told me 20 years ago, if you work on these eight tenants, you will have less pain and live a more vibrant life, I would apply them. Because my goal is to reduce that trigger, reduce that pain and live a better life. So I would enter that conversation by starting there. And there are many people who are in different, you know, levels of self-awareness. But I think if we all worked on that, it would be better for the patient. Again, thinking macro, what's their environment? And then that would elevate their sense of care. So that's the first one, self-awareness. How do we develop a sense of self-awareness? Through looking at our perspective of life, our humility, humor, such a good thing to have in life, acceptance of self and others, forgiveness. Are we kind to ourselves? Do we forgive ourselves for almost not treating ourselves well enough sometimes? And then do we forgive others? So it's a two-way street. Do we forgive others who may have not treated us or given us the care as quickly or as rapidly as we could have for whatever reason on that particular day so that we're not holding on to that sense of you didn't provide what I needed because that in itself is a stressor. So being able to release that allows us to better care for ourselves and maybe allows the other person to do a better job also. Gratitude, Thank thankful for just being here for instance and the simple things in life and not being caught up so much in the cycle that our disease process can sometimes try to take over. And it is almost coming back to it over and over again, because we are human, we have challenges, and having this disease process can really kind of remove that sense of self. So we have to continually practice these things so that we come back to who we are, doing things with compassion, and generosity. So working on each of these components 
helps you develop your self-awareness and find your joy. So it's not just a random, how do I reach for it out of the sky and I'm just going to work on myself? Now, I, when you have a pointed and directed plan, it really helps you build that internal self-awareness. Meditation, a very good one. And I also call it mindfulness because sometimes the word meditation can take some people aback. But what I have learned over the years uh, of taking care of myself and taking care of others is that having an opportunity to quiet the chattering of the mind helps us find and develop a sense of inner peace and self-worth that was already there. This allows our bodies to perform at its peak because our bodies are intuitively very intelligent, but we are so caught up in what's going on outside and external influences that sometimes we don't take the time to pause and really listen to what our body is telling us because there's a continual communication between our bodies, our mind and our spirits. That we are then able to realize that, that there's a power of happiness and that we can allow our bodies that just lie within us and we can allow our bodies to perform at its peak. We recognize that we have choices. One of the things that are, we struggle with with sickle cell disease and many individuals is feeling like we don't have power, that we're away from us and how do we control things? But in being still and being in focusing on self and having a moment of mindfulness, we realize that we do have choices that empower us. And the more inwardly we define ourselves, right, the less we need the external things to have power. Now, this is a gradual process. It's not going to happen overnight. But by doing small things over and over and over again, you build this resilience. We're already resilient. We bounce back each time we have a crisis and a challenge or something does not go right. So what about we train our minds and use that internal power with a little bit more structure? Next tenant, I think, is nutrition. Yes. So overall, so the bottom line for nutrition is just to eat more whole foods. Foods that when you see them, they look like they did when they came out of the earth and the ground because they are full of nutrients, they're full of vitamins, they're full of minerals. And as individuals with sickle cell disease, research has shown that our bodies work at a higher metabolic rate so that we require more nutrients. And there have been studies that show which vitamins we're more deficient in and all that, but that's an entirely different presentation. What I wanna focus on is if you just start by putting more whole foods, more plant-based foods in your, in your diet, you will naturally get those things that you tend to be deficient in. That's the first thing. So every meal plan, I meet everybody where they're at. It's not an all or none. It's making small adjustments and putting those better things into your meal plan. Now, if I had an optimal world and I were to blink and be a genie, I might make some other suggestions. So I might say, aim for a plant-based diet. Aim for a meal plan that's a little bit more gluten-free because gluten has shown to drive up inflammation. And we know that inflammation is part of our disease process. So can we eliminate the things that would cause more inflammation? Can we reduce the sugar that we have in our diets and our meal plan, because that also increases the work that our body needs to do and also increases something we call free radicals and, and also um, inflammation. Can we do more of a dairy-free meal plan? Alcohol in moderation, because again, that's a sugar. So the things that our body has to work harder to break down, we want to eliminate that so that our bodies can function optimally. We are a reflection of the fuel that we put in our body. In an ideal world, it would be a vegan or vegetarian diet, but that's not for everyone. So again, I want to just meet people where they're at and start with putting more whole foods into their body. Some, some things that really help with mental health are greens, berries, yogurts, walnuts, salmon, and celery. Movement, one of my favorites. Benefits include increasing the number of small vessels in your muscles. We know that part of our disease process is a vascular disease. It's part is a vascular disease. So how can we make those vessels healthier? We increase the supply of blood and oxygen to our body. Again, reflective of our disease process. Our cells have has trouble carrying all the oxygen molecules. So how can we provide more oxygen in a safe way to our body? Exercise 
gives you a happy pill, what I call the endorphin or mood on a day-to-day basis. Because this, ch- this illness is challenging. We have to battle it on a day-to-day process. So if I can wake up in the morning and kind of calm my mind down so I'm not thinking about my disease process, then give myself a natural happy pill and then fill my body with all this good stuff that's going to heal, I think I can, those are things that I can feel empowered doing. Those are things that are accessible. I'm not running to a hospital or clinic to do those things. So I'm building my life on top of these components that I actually have some, some control over. Exercise also strengthens the vascular wall, decreases blood pressure, decreases blood clot motation, uh, formation, decreases triglycerides, and increases good cholesterol. All good things. How do I start? Walk. Come out of your house, walk to the corner, and then walk back to the house. And then the next day, walk two blocks, and then walk back to the house. Damn, I believe for five minutes. Find something that is easy, accessible, and that you can do on a regular basis. So one of my favorites is yoga. And some people might say, ah, yoga, what's that about? Why should I do that? I know I'm running a little close on time, but I will end with with this and wrap it up. Yoga is really, think of it as the yolk of an egg and that it unites and brings you together so that it brings all the components of your body together. So yoga is actually a collection of breathing techniques moving meditation, visualization, progressive relaxation, self-analysis and altruism. And that's why it's so good to one, do it because the movements quiet the nervous system down, helps you breathe better. And what I've found is that when I do my yoga on my mat, because I challenge myself there, I'm better able to automatically deal with the challenges that are presented to me by my disease process, because I'll go right into what I've practiced on the mat, which is slowing my body down, relaxing my nervous system, breathing a little bit better and being calm. Connections is when I is replaced by we, even illness becomes wellness, but you want to connect and communicate on a very specific level. I will say that you wanna create a judgment-free and safe place. It's not just about talking, it's about being able to be vulnerable and really communicating and connecting with someone. That's very different from just IGing someone on the phone or social media or having a very brief conversation. Connections are what sustain us. So my last slide is by opening up our hearts, And building these wellness fundamentals, we will be giving individuals with sickle cell disease the tools that that are accessible to live their best life. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you so much for your time. I think I'm right on time, right, Isabella? I didn't want to go over. You have done excellent, um, Marjorie. It was very, very informative. And I really like how um, this actually speaks to anybody really, not just people with sickle cell disease. Um, it speaks to the families caring for those people. It speaks to friends and um, and family members yeah. as well. So I, I'm, I'm really grateful for this presentation. As a mother of children that are warriors as also, um, I think these are some really good messages. And that is about just mental health, looking after your mind looking after inside your body. So diet and exercise, all very, very important um, for anybody anybody. living with a chronic illness.